9 of our end time seminar. And if you'll open your syllabus, we'll start out taking a look at uh, the Great Tribulation. Now, as we once again look at our chart, you will see that the Great Tribulation is the seven-year time period, the seven-year time period that takes place on earth. Now, there are other things that take place during this seven-year tribulation. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's the judgment seat of Christ. But they take place in heaven. That's where the church is. That's where you will be. But the great tribulation takes place on earth. These seven years are divided into two 42-month periods or two three-and-a-half-year periods or two periods of 1,260 days. And you'll see through prophetic Scripture that there are several times where it talks about things happening for 1,260 days. If you meter that out, that's three and a half years. That is one half of the tribulation. The reason for this is because during the tribulation, it is literally divided into two halves. The first half, the 1,260 days, 42 months, or the three and a half years at the beginning are relatively calm. The last three and a half years are horrible. And we want to understand this, that this represents the ultimate defeat of the Antichrist. Now, it's not the ultimate defeat of the devil, because the devil will show up again 1,000 years later. But for the Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, and all of these characters that are listed in your Bible that bring great upheaval to the earth during the tribulation, this is the end of them. The city of Jerusalem is the apple of God's eye, and it is the ultimate desire of the Antichrist. He desires Jerusalem. Isn't it amazing that a little country smaller than New Jersey, than the state of New Jersey, you could put many, many, many Israels in the state of Missouri or in the state of Texas or basically just about in any state in the United States. It's very small. In fact, if Israel were to give up the West Bank, which actually we shouldn't call it the West Bank. We should call it what the Bible calls it, Judea Samaria. If Israel were to give up that land to the enemy, Israel, the width of Israel in the center of Israel, would be 9 to 11 miles. For those of you who drove to this conference and you came through the town down the road, Camdenton, in fact, it's so close, many of the people that go to this church live in Camdenton. If this Walmart doesn't have what you need, you drive down to that Walmart. They're real close. That would be the width of the nation of Israel if they were to give up the land that the Palestinians want them to give up. That, that's why it's so ridiculous for Israel to give up that land. Their entire nation would be narrower than our county. So it's God's land that he gave to his people. And the Bible does prophesy that there are boundaries that they will have. There's, there's a place called Israel that God's people will occupy. And the scripture says when they occupy it, the boundaries will be here and the boundaries will be there. And, and it's a pretty good chunk of land over there. But the devil is always against. Satan is always against whatever it is that God's doing. And if God says his people will have that land, well, the devil just gets prideful and he says, well, no, they won't. And that's why today you can turn on the news just about any time of day. And you can turn on Fox News or NBC or CNN. It stands for Constant Negative News. You, you, can, you, can, you can turn on any of these news channels and just wait a few moments and there'll be something about Jerusalem, something about Israel. Why? It's the focal point of everything in God's prophetic future. 
After the future rebuilding of the temple, the Antichrist will attempt to place his throne on the holy place in the temple. Did you know that when it comes to Islam, we'll just mention this, that Jerusalem is not even mentioned, the city of Jerusalem is not even mentioned in the Quran. If you will look at the pictures of the Jews, or excuse me, I, I apologize, of the Muslims who are praying near the Temple Mount in Israel, they are facing their holy area. Their backsides are toward Temple Mount. But God has a special love for that place. You know, where the temple is, where Temple Mount is, many Jews believe, and history tells us, Jewish history tells us, that that was the place where Adam was created. That rock, that stone, was the threshing floor that David purchased. That was the location where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. It's the place where God told Solomon to build a temple. It's the place where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. It's a holy place. And the devil wants to defile it. The Spirit of Grace is on Jerusalem. We need to understand that uh, although many people believe that Ezekiel 38, the battle, the war of Ezekiel 38, will usher in the uh, time of the Antichrist and the Great War, we need to take a look at what the Scripture says. And in Daniel chapter 9, 27, I'm going to be reading this from the Amplified. I want to read this to you. It says, and he shall enter into a strong and firm covenant with the many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of that week, that's the middle of that week, the middle of the seven years, he shall cause the sacrifice and offering to cease for the remaining three and one half years. And upon the wing or pinnacle of admonition shall come one who makes desolate until the full determ determined end is poured out on the desolator. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they who look on me, whom they pierce, they will look upon him. They, they will see him. They will recognize him. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. We need to understand that there are several reasons, there are purposes for the tribulation. We'll get into that in just a few moments. Well, let's just take a look at it now. It is a time for judgment of the Gentiles. In Old Testament Scripture, it talks about there will be a judgment on the nations that have come against Israel. This is that time. It will also be a time of great evangelism in the world. There will be one of the greatest harvests for the kingdom of God during the tribulation that this world has ever seen. The world is expanding in numbers at a phenomenal rate. At the time of Jesus, there were less people on the earth than what there are now in the United States. The population of the world is increasing within the generations by billions at a time. At the time of the Great Tribulation, there will be billions of lost people on this earth. But because of the tribulation, there will be a great influx into the kingdom of God. Once again, someone may say, my goodness, that means the church is going to be great. Well, no, the church is not here. The church is in heaven. The church is sealed. And these people who receive Jesus as their Messiah during the tribulation, whether they be Jew or Greek, they will be saved, but not born again into the church. Well, what, what does that mean? How could they be saved and not born again and be a part of the church? 
They're not a part of the church, but they are saved from destruction. That means they have long life, but they just don't have long life as the church. Once again, the church is a very unique. We don't deserve it. We didn't do anything to get it. In fact, after the last session last night, some of us were talking and, and we were talking about, why us? What did we do to be a part of the church? Well, here's the key. Absolutely nothing. It's by His grace. That's why God's going to be able to look at the church and He'll, he'll be able to say, I took this group of knuckleheads and I adopted them and they are now my children with the same rights that I have. I created them in my image and in my likeness. And it's not by the works of righteousness that they have done, because their righteousness is like filthy rags. But I gave them my righteousness and the blood of my Son, and now they can rule and reign with me for all eternity. The church is a special, unique group. Also, this time will be a time when Israel turns to Jesus as the Messiah. Now, religious Israel right now, they recognize Jehovah God as the Lord God. But they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. But this time of tribulation will open their eyes. Keep in mind that God blinded them. Do you remember that? In your Bible studies, God blinded the eyes of Israel. But now He opens their eyes during the Great Tribulation. And they look upon the one that they have pierced. And according to Scripture, they give Him honor and give Him recognition. And they get saved from destruction and saved from eternal torment and saved from hell fire. But they're still not a part of the church. And they still don't have glorified bodies. All right. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 to 9. In the New Living Translation, it says, In all history, there has never been such a time of terror. It will be a time of trouble for my people. Yet, in the end, they will be saved. Now, when he's talking about his people, this is in the book of Jeremiah. He's talking about the Hebrews. He's talking about the Jews. He says, there will never be a time of such great trouble. Yet, in the end, they will be what? They will be saved. For in that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will break the yoke from their necks and snap their chains. Foreigners will no longer be their masters. For my people will serve the Lord their God and their king descended from David, the king I will raise up for them. Oh my goodness gracious. Their eyes will be opened and they'll recognize the king of kings. Jeremiah 30, 11 says, For I am with you and will save you, says the Lord. I will completely destroy the nations where I have scattered you. Well, the Christians weren't scattered. It was the Hebrews that were scattered. So he's talking to who? The Hebrews, to the Jews. I will completely destroy the nations where I have scattered you, but I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but with justice. I cannot let you go unpunished. Jesus coined a phrase, and the phrase he coined was the Great Tribulation. Look at what he says in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since when? Since the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of the world. There hasn't been this great of a tribulation until this time. No, no nor ever shall be. So, this tells us that this tribulation 
will be a greater burden on God's people than any tribulation. And you know, they've been through some tribulations. Wow. The church will be avenged during the tribulation for the persecution that we've encountered. Now, although we are in heaven, we still have an avenger. You know, the, the Scripture tells us that there is an avenger of the brethren. There is an avenger that will fight our battles for us. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Amazing. Isn't that interesting? When's this going to happen? When He comes in that day to be glorified with His saints. That's us. The church, you must understand this, will not go through the tribulation. Now, why do I keep saying this? It's because many preachers, many seminars, many movies... Now, those of you who are pastors, your people go out and watch movies at the movie theater. And there's a lot of good Christian movies. But there's a lot of bad theology in the good Christian movies. I watched a Christian movie a few months ago that I thought was amazingly good. And when someone died, they implied, well, we don't know why God killed you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Our Lord comes to bring life. And if life is involved, it's God. If death is involved, it's not. All right? Romans 5.9 says, Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. The church is not appointed to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I mean, these Scriptures should really let us know as, as the church that the Jesus who saved us during the age of the church is going to show up and deliver us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath to come? It's the Great Tribulation. So quit worrying about the stormtroopers, 666. Take the bunker you built for the Tribulation and just turn it into a storm cellar or rent it out to somebody. Because you're not going to be here during the tribulation. You're not, you're not going to have to hunker in the bunker and hide from the devil. You're going to be tucked away in heaven. Hmm. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my commandments to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which is to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. You don't need to be tested. Why? You have already been tested. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your test for salvation is over. Now this class will have a test in just a little bit. Your test isn't over yet. But that's not what the Scripture is talking about. Now, <laughs> yeah, he said thinking of tribulation there for a moment. There will be 144,000 Jewish men who will evangelize during this time of, of great tribulation. There is no place in the Scripture that says that the people who receive their teaching 
will have glorified bodies and become part of the church. It does say that they will be saved. But you've got to understand that being saved means saved from something. We are born again and saved. Israel will be saved. Those who receive Jesus as the Messiah during the tribulation will be saved, but not born again. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, let's take a look at this. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and, care, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped Him, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Wow, who is it that's doing that? It's time for a question and answer. Who is, where are you in this picture? You're serving God, where? In heaven. You're having a good time. Let's take a look at verse 13. Then one of the elders answered and said to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the sons who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. So we are still dealing with the heavenly Jerusalem and not the new Jerusalem because there's a temple there. All right. And he who, he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. And they shall neither hunger nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Listen to me. There, there's good things happening in heaven. Good things happen. Now, let's just take a look at something that Jesus said, and this is in reference uh, to the 144,000 and to angels and to other people. In Matthew 24, 14, look at what Jesus said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Once again, looking at the chart here, He's not talking about now. He's talking about during the Great Tribulation. How do we know this? If you look earlier in that chapter, you will find where his disciples ask him, when are you coming to set up your kingdom? When is he coming to set up his kingdom? At the second coming, at the end of the tribulation, he's coming to set up his kingdom. That is what he refers to as the end. When he makes a, a statement like, those who endure to the end will be saved, he doesn't say those who endure to the end will be born again. He says those who endure to the end will be saved. He's referring to the time of the Great Tribulation. If you can not take the mark of the beast and, and you, can, you can endure to the end, you'll be saved. When He comes with His angels and the saints of glory and touches down on the Mount of Olives and sets up His kingdom. But during this time, we're having a party in heaven but there's 144,000 young Jewish men, once again, 
not 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses. See, we need to understand this too. The, the, the Antichrist is not successful in taking over the earth. Let's take a look at Revelation 6, 8. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. Now, Hades is a place, but Hades is not only a place, there is a spirit of Hades. Death is something that happens, but there is also a spirit of death. Because you don't have a concept and a location riding on horses. All right. And power was given to them over how much of the earth? What does it say? Over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and hunger and death and by the beasts of the earth. So if they are given authority over a fourth of the earth, how much of the earth is not under their authority? Three-fourths. Okay. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. There are 144,000 people, men, preaching about Jesus being the Messiah. I've mentioned in previous sessions if you have any anti-Semitism in you at all, you need to get rid of it. You must get rid of it. Because during the tribulation, the Lord God Almighty, Lord Jehovah, yud heh vav -Hey, the Creator of the universe, is going to choose 144,000 Jews to evangelize the world. Wait a minute. That says Southern Baptist. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not 144,000 Southern Baptists. Why? Hopefully, the 144,000 <laughs> Southern Baptists I know will be in heaven. All right. Unless they were just faking it at church. All right, Revelation 11, verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. See, there we have that again, the 1,260 days. What is that? Three and a half months, 42 weeks, one half of the tribulation. <laughs> These witnesses and the 144,000 are the thorn in the side to the Antichrist. He just can't seem to shake them. Everything he does, they mess up. You do understand if you really just sit down and read all about the tribulation, you'll find, it, find out that the Antichrist has so much rebellion within his own ranks that it is a constant putting out fires in his own house. It's not fun following the devil. He'll turn on you. You know, it is true. There is no honor among thieves. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. What are the days of their prophecy? 1,260 days. Three and a half years. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth 
with all plagues as often as they want to. <laughs> These are the two, I would like to write, write a book sometime called The Two Bad Boys of Revelation. <laughs> Because these guys get with it. I mean, the devil is just beside himself. All right. See, we need to understand that the book of Revelation, which, by the way, it's not the book of Revelations. It's one revelation. The book of Revelation. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist or not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a book of victory. It's, it's a, book a book that should, should make, make us jump up and down and go, woohoo! And, and some, some people don't even like to read it. You know, when it starts out, the beginning of Revelation says, for those who read this book, you'll be blessed. And there's a special blessing for studying end times prophecy. There's a special blessing to read the book of Revelation. I have a relative, I mentioned to them that I was doing an end-time seminar. They said, are you going to be talking about the book of Revelation? I said, yes, we are. I said, what do you think about the book of Revelation? Well, I haven't read it. Now, this is a person who's gone to church all their life. And they, one of the books of the Bible, they haven't read. I said, well, how come? And she said, it scares me. I said, you know, I may have been born at night, but not last night. Let, let me ask you something. How do you know it scares you if you've never read it? <laughs> and some people, once again, as my grandma would say, they're just as scared of getting as scared. <laughs> All right. Revelation 14.6 Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. There will be an angel. You might say dropping leaflets from heaven. So, if the 144,000 don't get you, and the two witnesses don't get you, there's the possibility an angel may get you saved. God is, the way we would say it, He's pulling out all the stops. I mean, this earth is going to get saved. Maybe this entire earth won't be a part of the church, but He's planning on this entire earth getting saved. Wow. The Son of Man, then what happens is the Son of Man, along with His angels and His church, descend from heaven to the Mount of Olives and annihilates the enemy marking the end of the tribulation on earth. Wow, this is good, isn't it? Revelation 1.3 Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Well, if it was near when he wrote it, it's nearer now. And as you read Revelation about the good things that are going to happen with the revelation of Jesus, your faith will build. Because Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Well, let's talk for just a few moments in this session. In the next five minutes, we will cover the next six pages in my notes. So we'll be kind of quick here. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. I've heard people say, there you go. That's why the rapture is going to happen so quick. Excuse me, that's not referring to the rapture. That's referring to the second coming. Once again, they ask Him, when are you coming to set up your kingdom? And He says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then as lightning flashes, I'm going to show up. But he's talking about the second coming there. Matthew 24, verses 30 to 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Now the clouds of heaven are not precipitation. 
There are people who say, well, Jesus can't come today because it's a clear sky. No, it's not talking about clouds of precipitation. Many times when it's talking about the clouds, it's talking about the saints or the glory. Remember, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, all right? Jesus is coming with the clouds in the glory, all right? Okay. The Son of Man is coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect. That's us. Where are we right now? At the time of the second coming, the tribulation has just completed. Where are we? We are in heaven with our resurrected bodies. We're not getting ready to be glorified. We've already been glorified. We've already got our rewards. We've already been to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're in heaven. Now when Jesus decides to come and touch down on the Mount of Olives and set up His millennial kingdom, what happens? He sends His angels to the four winds of heaven from one end of heaven to the other to collect the elect and bring us together so that when He comes down to earth, we come down to earth with Him. Wow. Once again, the rapture and the second coming are two distinct separate events that take place seven years apart. Hmm. Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Let's take a look at it. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. This is telling us that the heavens are going to give us signs. And the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of, clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is referring to the second coming. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth. The Scripture tells us that the sun, the moon, and the stars, these celestial bodies out there, are there for multiple purposes, but one of the main purposes is they are there for a sign. You know, some people just can't read signs. I met a guy at an intersection the other day that couldn't read a sign. In Zechariah 14.4, it says, talking about the touchdown of Jesus on the earth, the Scripture says, And in that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from the east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. When Jesus comes back, He's not going to come back like a ballerina. He's coming back like the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and when He touches down, there will be a great earthquake, and this place that they have fought over through all of these centuries, it's just going to be split into that mountain right there, and half of it moved to the north, and half of it moved to the south. Wow. Well, the Bible tells us that the beast, the false prophet, and the kings of the earth will gather their armies to come against the holy city, and the kingdom of God. And then the door of heaven opens. Wow. What happens? Bottom line is, the enemy is defeated. Satan is defeated by the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. 
See, there's some symbolism here too. Jesus is the Word of God and He defeats the enemy. We use the Word of God to defeat the enemy. I just want to digress on something that's earlier in the book that we didn't touch on for just a moment. You remember when Adam and Eve and the serpent were getting their tongue lashing from God. Remember that? And God talked to the woman and to the serpent. And He said to the woman, He said, Your seed and the seed of the serpent there will always be enmity between the two of you. Now, enmity means war. There's going to be a battle between your seed and the seed of the serpent. And I've always heard it taught all my life that the seed of the woman was Jesus. And it's true, and it's even mentioned in Scripture that Jesus is the seed that came from the woman. Because down through the generations, from Eve, Jesus was born of a virgin woman 4,000 years later. But if there's going to be war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman is one of her descendants, who's the descendant of the serpent? If there's going to be a battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So here's what I got to, to looking at one day, and I really believe that God gave me a revelation on this. The seed of the woman is Jesus, but Jesus is the Word of God. The enemy, the offspring of the devil, are the words of the devil. And for all of mankind, until the devil is put away permanently, there will be a war, enmity, between the Word of God and the words of the enemy. And even with us right now on the earth, in the realm of our mind, every day, we have coming into our mind the Word of God. We have coming into our mind the words of the world. And there's a battle taking place. Joyce Meyer put it this way in the title of her book. It's the battlefield of the mind. And the battle that's taking place is between the Word of God and the words of the world. Instead of it being the, the war of the worlds, it's the war of the words. And it takes place in your mind. And you are the one who decides which words you keep and which words you reject. And then you always have some goofy person who says, well, Pastor, I just, I just can't help what I think. Well, the answer to that is, liar, liar, pants on fire. Yes, you can. Now, that, that's goofy. To not, your, it's your brain, and it's in your head. The enemy says you can't help what you think. That's not true. The Bible tells us you can help what you think. In fact, the Bible says... Whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, think about this. We wouldn't be told to think about something if we didn't have control of our brain so we could. And then, then there's another place that says every thought that rises up against the knowledge of God, here's what you do. You take that thought captive and you cast it down. Why? Because you can. As a born-again believer, you have the fruit of the Spirit within you. Galatians 5.22, which is love, joy, peace. That's the first three of the nine. Everybody knows those. Love, joy, peace. And some people know patience and kindness. And then you get, you get all the way down to the end. But the ninth one is self-control. And the nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit are not something that you pray for to get. They are something that you already have. You have self-control. You say, well, I can't control myself. Well, then that's because you choose not to. Because you have self-control. So, there's a war going on. And in the time of the tribulation, once again, there's enmity between the Word of God and the words of the enemy. But I think it's so interesting that uh, in Revelation 19... 
13, it says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. And so the Word of God defeated the enemy. Now, in Daniel, we'll quickly address this. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is written by a Jew to the Jews by Jehovah God and revelation of the Holy Spirit and it's recorded in our Bible. And it says that they will have, the Jews will have a resurrection after the time of great tribulation. So at the end of the seven years, when Jesus returns and touches down on the Mount of Olives and the mountain is split, that is the time right there that Scripture says that God's chosen people, the Jews, will have their resurrection. That's when they have their resurrection. It does not say that they are raptured. If I alluded to that in a previous message, that's not what I meant. They are, the Jews are not raptured. They are resurrected. But they, it never says that they are resurrected with glorified bodies. They are resurrected with natural human bodies. So that they can occupy earthly Jerusalem during the millennium. While we are ruling and reigning out of the heavenly Jerusalem, they are ruling out of the earthly Jerusalem. Who are they ruling over? The nations. Who are we ruling over? Everybody. Now, there is also, at this time, there is a judgment that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, and it's called the sheep and the goat judgment. Jesus said that when he returns, all the nations will stand before him, and he will separate them. Let's take a look at what it says here in Matthew 25, 31 to 33. Now, this is reading out of the New King James. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, this is the second coming, then He will set on, his, on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats He will put on His left. Now I understand the term Sheep nations and goat nations, I understand this. But entire nations of people will not be allowed into the, into the millennium and entire nations of people cast into hellfire based upon their passport. That's not the way God judges. However, nations will have during the tribulation and even during uh, the millennium, nations will be judged on how they treated God's people, on how they treated Israel. And specifically, nations will cease to exist at the time of the second coming if they did not treat the Jews properly during the tribulation. And other nations will continue to exist and move on into the millennium if they treated the Jews properly. Now, I want to read this to you. Um, I am not, I shouldn't say this, I am not necessarily a Greek scholar, although I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express once. <laughs> now the, when, I, when I met Loretta, I had already taken... Uh, two semesters of Greek. When I met her, 
she started taking Greek. I retook those semesters. And then I got hooked and I went on and, and I've got all the hours you can get at Southwest Baptist University in Greek. But uh, sometimes things are translated better and more understood in certain versions of the Bible than in others. And I was looking at which version of the Bible clearly explains what that verse actually says. And it ended up being the Message Bible. And so I'm going to read this to you out of the Message Bible. Talking about the separating of the sheep and the goats. The Son of Man will take His place on His glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before Him and He will sort the people out much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats putting his sheep on his right and his goats on his left. Just think about it. If you are a person and you received Jesus as the Messiah, you recognized Him as the Messiah, you honored Him as a Messiah, but you lived in a country that didn't, well, God's not going to send you into everlasting fire because of what other people did. Now, that nation may cease to exist, and if you had a nation called Goofystan, and Goofystan didn't honor God during the tribulation, but you did, you would get to move into the, tribula into the millennium and live on the earth. But Goofystan would cease to exist. There would not be a country called Goofystan in the millennium. Now, if you lived in a country, likewise, you live in a country and you curse the Jews, you curse God, but you live in a country that honored God, that country would continue to exist in the millennium, but you would not. Because God judges, and you'll find this all the way through, He judges the hearts of men. You are not judged by where you live. Rahab the harlot lived in a heathen nation, but she honored God, and she became a, an ancestor to Jesus. Wow! Wow! So, at any rate, I hope that clears that up just a little bit. The result will be that the millennial kingdom on earth will be inhabited by tribulation saints who receive Jesus as their Messiah and bless the Jews instead of persecuting them during the tribulation. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 37, Then the righteous will answer Him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. He doesn't say, Surely, as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. He said, surely as you did it and to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. It's amazing how many times we'll get a scripture wrong by where we put the pause. It's just kind of like, let's take this phrase. Woman without her man is nothing. How do you like that, women? Woman without her man is nothing. I'm going to say the same thing. Woman without her man is nothing. Woman without her man is nothing. I said the exact same words. The only difference was where I paused. All right. Who are the tribulation saints? The tribulation saints are judged by their work of believing and enduring to the end, and that's where Jesus used this phrase in Matthew 24, 13, but he who endures to the end, the end of what? The end of the tribulation. Remember, they ask him, when are you going to set up your kingdom? 
And in that discourse, he says, now let me tell you this, he who endures to the end of this time will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from everlasting fire. And what's the reward? You get to live in the millennial kingdom on earth. All right. We'll take about a five-minute break, and we'll come back with Session 10. And in Session 10, we will talk about the millennium, the great white throne judgment, the new Jerusalem, and the next 480 million years.